Hey Trail Teens, Pastor Rob here again. Uh, we are going to be looking at the Ascension this morning in the book of Acts. We'll be in Acts chapter 1. Um, but first I've got an announcement I wanted to make. Uh, we are going to be starting a midweek Bible study for the middle school group on Zoom. Uh, will be the platform for that. And that's going to be on Tuesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. If uh, your parents have not heard from me yet about that, I'm trying to reach out to everybody. Um, uh, please have them email me at robert at trail.org. That's robert at trail.org. And about getting connected to the midweek Bible study for the middle school. And I will send them what they need to get you connected to that. Uh, and it'll be starting next Tuesday. It'll be, again, from 7 to 8 p.m. Well, with announcements done, let's uh, open with a word of prayer and spend the, some time in God's word. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now and we ask that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would draw us into your truth and your reality, that you would help us to see the things that we should be focused on as a Christian and that through your Spirit, Lord, that you would empower us to both be focused on the things we should be focused on and to do the things that you have called us to do. And so I pray as we look at your word that it would really mold and shape our hearts and our minds to be in line with your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I mentioned, we're going to be looking at the ascension. We, of course, just went through Passion Week. Uh, which uh, came together with uh, Easter last Sunday. And so, you know, Passion Week focuses on Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. And now, what comes next? The ascension, right? That Jesus ascended to go to be with the Father. And there are some very important things about the ascension that you and I need to be aware of as Christians, because these things matter a great deal in how we view ourselves in Christ and how we look at our present situation and, and our focus as it pertains to the future. There are three things we're going to see in the first 11 verses of Acts chapter 1 that we're going to focus on. The first is that Jesus is the promised king of God's kingdom, his eternal kingdom. That's the first thing we're going to see in this passage. The second thing that I want you to be looking for is that Jesus will return to fully establish his kingdom here on earth. Okay, that's the next thing that I want you to see. And also, the third thing that I want you to be looking for is that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring the hope of the gospel to the rest of the world. All these things are true in the, the ascension, and I want us to see those things, okay? So as we look at Acts chapter 1, I want us to be looking for those things. And just to let you know, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to turn to the Gospel of Luke. You don't need to yet, but we're going to in just a second, because the Gospel of Luke is the first volume of Luke's writings. So the author of Acts is Luke, if you didn't know that, and he, he also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And the Gospel of Luke is like volume one, and Acts is like volume two of his writings. Okay, and so as one ends, the other one picks up where the other one ended, okay? It's like having the sequel, you know? Uh, so we're going to start reading in verse 1 of Acts chapter 1. And he mentions the Gospel of Luke right off the bat. He says, in the first book, O Theophilus, and the first book would be the Gospel of Luke as we know it, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So right there he declares what 
volume one, the gospel of Luke is all about. And it's all about what Jesus did and taught in his earthly ministry. And it ends with his ascension. And then Acts picks up with his ascension and then continues into the early life of the church. And we're going to be starting actually um, a series going through Acts now um, each Sunday. And so for those of you that have been with us and we were going through 1 John, we're going to continue to go through 1 John, but we're going to pick that series up next Tuesday. And we're going to do it as our midweek Bible study uh, because we're going to be going through the book of Acts now on Sundays. But I want you to turn now to the Gospel of Luke, and I want you to see how Luke ends, and then you can see that it really is volume one, and then it goes to volume two. And Luke mentions some, some things in the Gospel of Luke that he doesn't mention here and vice versa, so it's good to read both the ending of Luke and the beginning of Acts. Starting in verse 44 of chapter 24, so the very end of the Gospel of Luke, then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. I want you to see here a couple of things that are really cool to note. First, he says everything in the Old Testament, that's Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, all of that means the entire Old Testament, the whole thing, he says, is all about me. Every single bit of it pointed to me, he says. And in all of the prophecies that pointed to me, all of them must be fulfilled. And one of the things that had yet to be fulfilled was the fact that he would ascend to go to be with the Father and later, which is yet to come, to return. All these things have been prophesied. And he says they had to take place. Just as they have had, just as they have taken place, it was written about, it was prophesied that I would die, that I would raise from the dead. These things were already foretold. And he points it out to them. And then something else happens that's really cool. He removes their blindness from seeing that in the Old Testament. And it says, and he gave them, their minds, understanding for the scriptures, that they understood what was written. This is something really cool that God does through the Holy Spirit to each and every one of his people. That as we read his word, the Spirit opens our minds of our hearts to the truth that is in God's word. And we see, oh my goodness, that is so cool. Look, this is all about Jesus. It's really cool what God does there. And he did it for them. He does it for us. If you have trouble understanding God's word, by the way, take heart. When I was your age, I did too. I would read the Bible and I would be like, it doesn't make any sense to me. And I remember I would pray and pray, God, open my mind to this. I don't understand it. He did not answer that prayer immediately, but he did answer it. And I read God's word and I love God's word and I I absorb it and I understand it more and more all the time, but there are still things that I don't understand. And as I grow in the Lord, more and more God reveals to me. So take heart, this is something that happens in the Christian life. And then he talks about that he has to go and be with the Father, right? But he's gonna send the promise. The promise is the Holy Spirit. He ends right here with the ascension. And he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands as he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. Now turn back to Acts and we're going to pick it up 
in verse 3. So he tells them all about what volume 1 was about, and this is volume 2, and he says in verse 3, And he presented himself alive to them after his suffering for many proofs, and appeared to them during 40 days, and speaking about the kingdom of God. So Jesus comes to the disciples over and over again, proving to them that he had risen from the dead and that his resurrection was not just spiritual, but physical. In many of the uh, cases that we read about where he wrote, appeared to them after the resurrection, he ate food in front of them. Why did he do that? Well, he did that to prove that he was actually a physical resurrected human being, that he wasn't just a spirit being, but a physical resurrected human and that is one of the great hopes that we have as Christians, that you and I one day will be just as Jesus is, that we will be resurrected human beings forever and ever, perfect, the way we should have been with if sin didn't exist. Our bodies won't ever decay. They won't die. They won't break down. They won't get sick. There'll be no coronaviruses to worry about. It will be just the way it's supposed to be, without any pain, without any sadness, without any death, but it will be physical. And that is cool because I like being physical and most people do. They like the fact that they're not just a spirit, you know, and I want you to know that that is what resurrection life is. It is physical. And so he showed many proofs to them. Well, he appeared to them over 40 days and then he goes on and well, staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he had said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So here's the promise of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, you know, the Spirit would come upon people before Jesus' ascension, but it wouldn't be a constant. It wouldn't be something that you always had. One of the aspects of the new covenant that we have in Jesus is that we have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit forever. That there is something different now that God has done with his people, and it is because of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension that this is made possible. He said, I am going to leave, but I am going to give you something that is really awesome. It's even better than me walking around with you. It is my life in you, the Holy Spirit. So this is the promise that is promised to them. And then we see the ascension in verses uh, 6 through 11. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So they asked him a question. Hey, we know that, you know, it would make sense, right? They know that there's a promise in the Old Testament that one of David's descendants will reign on an eternal throne, that he will reign forever and ever. They know that this promise exists. And you and I would also agree with them and think, you rose from the dead. You've defeated death. Is this it? Is this the time that you are now going to take your throne and reign uh, here on earth and elevate your people to be with you in that uh, kingdom forever and ever? It would be a logical question. And it is going to happen. It was foretold. They know it's going to happen. But his answer uh, tells them, basically, you don't need to worry about when that's going to fully take place. Instead, there's something else you need to worry about. He says, he said to them, verse 7, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. By the way, the words there, time and seasons in the Greek, they both can be translated time. The word time is, is chronos, like chronological time. That's where we get that from. And then the word seasons is kairos, meaning times or seasons, like appointed times, you know, like Fall is an appointed season of the year and winter and in spring and summer, right? So these are appointed times or seasons. So one is like there is a time within time and space that has been designed before the beginning of time that this will happen and you don't need to worry about it. And he that has been decided by God, that appointed time idea. So he uses both words in the Greek for time here. Uh, to tell us that there is, God is in control of this. He knows when it's going to happen. It is going to happen. 
but you don't need to worry about it because this time that the father is fixed by his own authority. You don't need to worry about it. But he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses, it says, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So he tells him, you don't need to worry about when this is going to take place, when my kingdom is going to be fully realized here on earth. You don't need to worry about that. What you do need to worry about, though, he says, is what you're supposed to do between now and then. And I am giving you my spirit, he says, to empower you to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. It's amazing. He goes on in verse 9 here. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing up into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, whom was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. There are three things that the ascension uh, confirms for us that we really need to hone in on. And those three things are that Jesus is, number one, that Jesus is the king of God's eternal kingdom. He's the promised king of God's eternal kingdom. The second is that we can be certain of Jesus's imminent return. We can have total confidence that he is going to return. It is absolutely going to happen. And third, that we can have confidence in the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, which has been poured out on his people because he ascended to be with the Father. So I want to look at these three things as it pertains to the section that we just went through in our remaining time. So first, I want to look at how he is the promised king in God's kingdom. Jesus fulfills all of the Old Testament prophecies about who this king would be. And he's a descendant of David, which was absolutely essential for him to be uh, the eternal king in God's kingdom. And that promise is made in a number of places. And one of them is uh, Psalms 110. And this, this throne that David's descendant would be placed on, this throne is in heaven, the Bible tells us. So he is the ruler of God's people, not just Jerusalem, but all of God's people, right? So true Israel is all of God's people. And so sometimes when the Bible refers to Israel, it, especially in the New Testament, it is referring to all of the people that belong to God as well. Not all the time, but a lot of times it's what it's referring to. And so you have God's people that he is the king over all of God's people and his throne is in heaven. Well, this is Jesus. He ascended to be on his throne, seated at the right hand of the father. We see this many times over and over in the Bible. Jesus declared in Matthew 28, verse 18, he said, all authority has been given to me. This is after his resurrection. So he rose from the dead. This is at the end of Matthew's gospel. And he's telling everybody, I am king. I have conquered death. I am taking my place on my father's throne in heaven by his appointment. And I am king reigning and ruling over all creation. He says, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. All of it is under my domain. He is the king. The writer in Hebrews does a really good job in Hebrews chapter one. If you want to turn there, you can. If not, I'm going to read through it. It'll be fine. But if you want to turn there, it's Hebrews chapter one, verses one through four. But the writer of Hebrews does a great job describing how awesome Jesus is. And I'll just read it to you. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also we receive, through whom we also, oh, sorry, 
Let me back up. So I'm going to start over. Long ago, because I lost my place, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. That's where I got messed up. So he's created the world, so he appointed all things to him, and he is the creator of the world too, which means he's God, right? Uh, God created the world. We know that from Genesis 1-1 in the beginning, God created, right? So Jesus is the God who created everything, spoke everything into existence. We also know that who God is by looking at Jesus. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father also, right? So he's God in the flesh. And he goes on, he says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. How amazing is that, right? So Jesus, if you want to know who God is, who do you look at? Jesus, right? You look at Jesus. He is God's communication to us of who God is and how much he loves us. Isn't that cool? If you want to know who God is and how much he loves you, you just look at Jesus. He is how God has communicated that to us. After making purification for sin, which is his death, right, and resurrection, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. See, he ascended up into heaven, and he sits on the throne of heaven, having become as much superior to angels as the name as he has inherited, is more excellent than theirs. He's above everything in heaven and on earth. Wow. So Jesus is the king of God's kingdom. Secondly, we can be confident, and this is huge, guys. It really is. This is absolutely important for us to understand. We can be totally confident that Jesus is going to return. Look back at Acts 1.11. It says, the, these you know, two angels appear, right? And they ask all the guys standing there, all of Jesus' disciples, like, what are you doing? Why are you staring up at the sky, right? He says, why do you look, stand looking into the heavens? This Jesus, who was taken from you in, up into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Will come. It's going to happen. Don't sit there waiting for him. And, you know, as they were looking up into the sky, they were wanting what any of us would have wanted. They would have wanted Jesus to come back and hang out with them. They would have wanted it to go back to the way it was, back to what they knew and loved. They loved being with Jesus. They loved watching Jesus do miracles. They loved living life with Jesus. They loved all of these things, and they wanted it to be the way it was. And that's a totally normal thing when there is a change in your life, and it's not the way it used to be. It's not what you liked and what you were used to. And we find ourselves in a similar situation right now. I find myself in the coronavirus situation that we find ourselves in, wishing that it would be the way it was. You know, I mean, I'll be honest with you guys, a week has not gone by where I haven't cried about the situation we're in for one reason or another. Sometimes it's uh, tears of joy because I see good things that God is doing, but sometimes it's uh, tears of sorrow because of things we can't do right now. And it's just a hard, stressful time. And uh, I definitely have wanted it to go back to the way it was. But this verse is a reminder to me as a Christian that we are not supposed to long for what was. We are always supposed to have our eyes fixed on the future of what is going to be. Not what could be, not what we would like it to be, but what will be, because what will be is better than anything we could possibly hope for in our own power and strength. The return of Jesus, the ushering in of his eternal kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, this is our future as Christians. And we are supposed to eagerly long for that, always looking forward and not being overly concerned with our present situation and definitely not wishing for what was. I was reminded today about how important it is to be focused on where you are going when you're learning to do something that's scary. 
um, and it involves movement, right? Because there's the risk of, of pain if you crash, right? So this is true of riding a bike or learning to drive a car or, or uh, doing um, uh, snow skiing or snowboarding or something, uh, skateboarding, you know, fill in the blank. Any activity where you're moving and you have to turn and things like that, when you're learning to do that, it's very scary because you don't want to fall. And if you fall, it's going to hurt and it's going to be bad. And, and you are like, well, I don't want this to happen. So you're worried and you're scared. And when you're scared about that stuff, you focus on where you are, not where on your, not where you're going. Okay. And anybody who is good at teaching people to do those activities, they always tell them, don't look at where you are, look at where you want to go. For instance, uh, if you're learning to ski or snowboard, you know, people are, you know, getting their feet under them where they're getting, you know, learning to be more steady. But then what happens is they get so worried and concerned about their present position and they're not paying attention to where they want to go. And what happens is they don't get to where they want to go very well. They end up falling, you know, same thing with riding a bike. If you need to make a turn, you don't look where you are currently at. You look forward into the turn saying, I'm going there. And when you do that, you go there, right? Same with driving, you know, and, but when you're, when you don't have confidence in those things, you will fail in those things and give in to fear because you're not confident of them. And I bring that up because as Christians, we need to be confident of where we are going. We are going to be with Jesus in his eternal kingdom. He will return and bring an end to this evil age, and we will reign with him forever and ever in the kingdom of God. This is a certainty, and we can be confident of it. And when we are confident of it, when we are in a scary situation, we can navigate it so much more smoothly. If we, if we were focused on that, where we are going, instead of where we are. And the last thing that I wanted us to know about the ascension is that the ascension brought about the promised gift of the Holy Spirit, that God's very essence, his life would be poured out in us to empower us to accomplish his mission for us on earth. That's incredible. His very life is poured out into us. Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do works that I do, meaning miracles, that if you believe in me, you will be able to do miracles. It's like, wow, that's amazing. But then he says something even more incredible. He says, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. So because I am ascending up into heaven to take my position with the Father, you will do even greater things than I did. Jesus rose people from the dead physically, people that were physically dead, like Lazarus, been dead four days, buried. He shows up, raises him from the dead with a word. How can anything be more, more amazing than that? How can anything be greater than raising somebody physically from the dead? And Jesus says, oh, there is something much greater than that, and you will do it. You know what that is? It's bringing spiritual life to the spiritually dead. That can only happen through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. When people put their faith in Jesus and who he is and what he has done, there is a supernatural event that takes place where his life fuses in with that person's soul and they become a regenerate human being. That is more amazing than raising people from the dead. And Christian friend, God has called you to that ministry of reconciliation Paul tells us that in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.18. He says that we are called to the ministry of reconciliation. The same way God, Jesus reconciled us to God, the Father, we bring that reconciliation, that message of hope of the gospel to other people. That ministry is the most profound thing that anyone can be a part of. Greater than raising somebody physically from the dead. Because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, he will live. So physical death, Lazarus had to die again. Have you ever thought about that? Lazarus was raised from the dead physically. 
He had to go through life for I don't know how much longer. And then he died again and went to be with the Lord for a second time. Like physical life is not what's important. Spiritual life is in through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, Christian friend, you are given the power to do that. I want to share with you in my, as I close here, a personal testimony of when I experienced this power. And, and I have, by God's grace, been a part of uh, bringing the hope of salvation to many, 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 many uh, people over the years. But the very first time I did it, it shocked me because I didn't know I was doing it. And I had no idea that what was happening was what was happening. I had somebody at work when I was 18 years old. They, we were on break and we were sitting together uh, visiting and they started asking me questions about my faith in Jesus. And I just started answering. And it was very, you know, I was relaxed. I wasn't stressed. I wasn't worried about it. I was just excited to tell them what I knew. And I was just sharing my the reason why I love Jesus. And I could not tell you for the life of me what I said to that person. I have no idea. But the Spirit moved through me and changed that person's life forever, and they gave their life to Jesus. They told me the following week, I am totally want to be a Christian now. I, and I was like, wow, that's amazing. Like, I had no idea. I was just talking to them. But God used me you know, through the power of the Holy Spirit to speak life into that person. And he can do that for you too. You don't need to know all the answers. Uh, it is good to grow in your knowledge of, of God. Obviously, God tells us to seek him and, and he will give to us uh, when we pursue righteousness and, and, and when we pursue goodness, he, he answers that prayer every time. And we grow in our knowledge of what that means by reading his word. We need to learn and grow but you only have what you have, and God will use that wherever you're at. I love the story of the blind man in John chapter 8, where Jesus heals the blind man, and then the, the scribes and the Pharisees come and start quit, uh, qu questioning the blind man and asking them all these questions about Jesus, all these theological things and other things. And, and the blind man says, I don't know about any of that, but I'll tell you what I do know. I was blind. And now I see. So he's like, I don't have any answers for you outside of that. And I'm going to trust Jesus. And that's all you have to do, Christian friend, is tell somebody why you love Jesus. And that's enough. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how amazing it is that you have called us into this resurrection life that you have defeated Satan, sin, and death, that you ascended to be with the Father, that we can hope in your imminent future return. We know it's coming. We don't know when. You told us not to worry about that, but you said, trust that it's going to happen. Know that it's going to happen. And I pray that we would be able, as your people, to always be looking to the future, eagerly awaiting and hopeful and excited about what is to come that we wouldn't be fearful about our present situation and that we would trust in your power of the Holy Spirit to do your work in our life and in other people's lives through that power. What an amazing gift you have given us. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a blessed rest of your day.